Welcome to Searching for the Question. My name is David Orban, and I am very excited for uh, today's uh, episode. Uh, at the beginning of the 90s, um, I was, uh, um, well, in love with uh, uh, Silicon Valley, but uh, with San Francisco especially. And uh, whenever I would be in the city, I would visit uh, the City Lights uh, bookstore. And uh, obviously, it has a fantastic and very famous uh, ambience and uh, uh, all kinds of crooks and, and, and uh, little niches. Uh, the science fiction section of the bookstore is great. There is a almost hidden poetry room at the, in the top. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, its uh, magazine uh, section is also stimulating and interesting. And I know, actually, it was January 1990 when in the magazine section of uh, the City Lights bookstore in San Francisco, I discovered Mondo 2000, a fantastic, crazy uh, cyberpunk magazine precursor to what would be in a much more diluted uh, mass uh, appeal way uh, wired magazine uh, years later, it, it uh, was a blast. And that is why I am so excited now uh, uh, to have as a guest the founder and editor of uh, Mondo 2000. Are you serious? Are you welcome to the show? Hello, everybody. So um, as we chatted with, with Are You, um, he told me about uh, his uh, current projects, uh, uh, especially the Mondo 2000 uh, history uh, project is very interesting. Uh, the book that he's also uh, working on, uh, but he's uh, so creative and uh, multifaceted. Uh, there is also uh, a, a new album, a series of songs. So we decided we will do it all. We will talk about a little bit the history uh, of uh, Mondo 2000, the history of the book that he's publishing. And are you, uh, you are also going to uh, um, give us a gift by reading an excerpt uh, of uh, from your book. Uh, uh, is that right? Yes, that's right. Yes. Shall I start with that? Uh, why didn't you start? Uh, you you told me that there is uh, also a little bit of story about a book. Oh yes. Um, okay. So uh, the book was picked up by a book company called Zero Books. Um, I should precede this maybe by saying that I had a record that was going to come out on a from a record company called Nothing Records, uh, run by Trent Reznor, and nothing was released. So now I had a book that was going to be with Zero Books, and Zero happened. Um, so, uh, my continued, uh, luck, I, I have the theory in terms of, uh, trying to do some NFTs that I, if I ever, uh, made a million dollars, capitalism itself would collapse, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm not complaining born under a bad sign or whatever, but I've got the rock and roll spirit. So, uh, absolutely. Um, so there you go. Uh, so yeah, zero books, uh, the person who was the acting publisher, uh, who was a big enthusiast for my work, uh, was uh, released uh, just as the book was in process. So uh, now it's back on sale again through a, through a representative, um, and uh, it's, it's stalled once again. The name of the book is The Freaks in the Machine, Mondo 2000 in 20th Century Tech Culture. So... Uh, Please go ahead, read us uh, yeah, yeah. the excerpt. So I'm going to read from an early part of the book, and it's called Chapter Zero, The Big Picture. Go ahead. Utopian Strain and Mondo 2000. While the publishing, quote, empire, close quote, that came to be called Mondo 2000 started in 1984, it really started like so many aspects of Western culture in the 1960s. Although in high school I was there, did we believe in magic? Let's put it this way. There appeared to be a lot of apparent opportunities for a radical transformation, a novel mutation in the human condition. 
In simple terms, two things seem plausible to idealists, coast scarcity and a global village. Running underneath, running underneath these prosaic currents was the excitability of youth and the notion that we represented a new sort of human, that we were mutants, freaks, post-scarcity. In the 1960s, a strand of the vibrant, rising counterculture that was largely situated in the wealthiest and most powerful nation state and that appeared to be taking on the world, believed it was entering the age of homo ludens, man at play. If we had enough generosity, enough collectivity, and enough celebratory desire, we can make it happen by the sheer force of generational girth and electrified minds via drugs or media or the combination thereof. To our untutored eyes, it appeared that to be such an excess of wealth that we are creating a garbage apocalypse with the overflow. The Haight-Ashbury utopian anarchist the Diggers wrote, America in 1968 is so incredibly wealthy that the local spiritual crisis is what are we going to do about the garbage? They said that a world where newly, in a world where newly psychedelicized views of the Haight-Ashbury and all across the West were the vanguard of a new equally distributed leisure class. They created a free store and distributed free food and other stuff in order to model the inevitable new society. In other words, their means for making a new world was do it yourself, do DIY. Not for them the tiresome slog of heading of leading unionized workers to take control of the means of production. Not for them dealing with the democratic instrumentalities of a centralized state. Although guaranteed income did smile upon the young from the horizon and the then welfare state was in a reasonably generous mode. It, not the diggers, was making our extended post-industrial adolescence possible. DIY would become the primary modality for countercultural activity. From the missionaries of the whole earth catalog and their tools of living, living tools for living, and the punks and their rejection of handed down rock stars and other media expressions in favor of their Cheap, own cheap and the intentionally unprofessional expressions. DIY defined the counterculture approach to the world and our world rejecting across the late 20th century. The attitude would infect the world of early computer hobbyists, and ultimately in the 90s, it would give it, it would be given a playful, surreal, madcap expression on the pages of Mondo 2000. Whether the world or even the privileged zones of the United States was in or on the verge of post-scarcity, wherein most alienated form of labor could be jettisoned in favor of a, of a celebratory culture which every man and woman could become a natural artist, not to mention a party animal, was dubious to say the least and certainly difficult to prove but one could put on one's futurist cap. Even then, the myth of the quickly or approaching and set to explode cyber revolution lurked in utopian dropout imaginations. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop that there. You got a taste of uh, what I'm trying to uh, put together. Oh yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, gave a taste uh, of the vocabulary, the sensorial richness, uh, uh, the uh, great expectations that uh, in those years uh, uh, permeated uh, uh, culture. Uh, and uh, the clash of pop culture, counterculture, uh, the waves of how uh, counterculture would be adopted uh, uh, by uh, corporate uh, interests uh, and uh, you know similarly to how punk uh, uh, became mainstream uh, the uh, uh, technologies uh, that uh, we would dream about uh, at the end of the 80s uh, now are in the hands of anyone and um, we uh, from time to time uh, forget uh, that we should feel uh, a, a profound sense of awe uh, 
just by seeing uh, that they exist. Uh, I want to remind uh, the people following us that at the end of 80s, uh, we were uh, still very much at the beginning of the personal computer revolution uh, that uh, put this fantastic and magical tool in the hands of millions of people. Uh, we were uh, at the beginning uh, of uh, what we now call the internet, uh, where uh, anyone could aim to connect with anyone else, uh, cross-fertilizing ideas and uh, really um, exposing themselves uh, to uh, the richness of the world's uh, culture. Uh, Mondo 2000, for me, uh, represented the yearning uh, to the experimentation that uh, could happen and did indeed happen in many ways in uh, uh, San Francisco and the Silicon Valley, uh, but uh, the rest of the world was ready to go through that kind of experimentation with a lag that uh, not only uh, was already diminishing, since then uh, it, it, it uh, um, was completely eliminated or even now we can find new uh, fashions, new fads, new waves emerging in other places. Uh, William Gibson uh, famously um, uh, wrote his uh, uh, um, uh, cyberpunk uh, uh, novels in, in uh, a futuristic Tokyo, uh, imagining that uh, as the center, center of uh, cyber culture. Uh, and maybe not Tokyo, maybe more uh, Seoul uh, in South Korea, or even more Shenzhen in China. Uh, but uh, a lot of things that mesmerize us today are coming out uh, from uh, other places. Uh, so thank you very much for offering us uh, that uh, glimpse of the book. And uh, uh, I am sure that uh, with the help of your capable agents, uh, a publisher will soon uh, pick it up and I cannot wait reading it. Uh, I um, uh, actually... Uh, in preparation of uh, our uh, chat, uh, looked up uh, the Mondo uh, covers. Uh, and uh, those who are not familiar with uh, the uh, magazine uh, can see a little bit of uh, its uh, aesthetic just from the covers uh, already. Uh, the uh, components of technology and um, uh, psychedelics, uh, counterculture and and the tools of empowerment really uh, were uh, always present. I am very happy to see uh, uh, that uh, the women in the cover are not objectified with our current sensibilities. Uh, not only the fact that there are so many, uh, but that they occupy a role of a protagonist and active role uh, rather than uh, being eye candy. Um, so uh, your uh, activities, uh, are you, are uh, multi-faceted. Uh, Let's uh, look at one of your latest uh, creations, which <laughs> is a, a usefully paradoxical song uh, available for sale on Bandcamp, both individually and as uh, part of an entire album, uh, on a name your price uh, model, where anyone who is um, uh, courageous enough to offer less than a dollar per song will be uh, uh, cast uh, uh, with some especially powerful uh, uh, negative energy from cyberspace. Uh, yeah. But uh, I, I, I hope that uh, everyone will go and, and buy either a song or for not less than $10 or $15, the entire album. So uh, let's uh, listen uh, to I'm Against I'm NFTs. I'm Against NFTs. It doesn't matter much to me. Money doesn't grow on trees. 
every currency has its own sleeves. Follow the birds, not the bees. Scratch that itch until it bleeds. Just for this moment, address our needs. Medical bills, mouths to feed. I'm against NFTs. It doesn't matter much to me. I need a cookie and a cashmere sweater. Strawberry Fjords forever. All right, that was fantastic. So, uh, uh, are you? Uh, uh, this is a paradoxical song, even more so because, if I am not mistaken, sooner or later, uh, it is going to be available as an NFT, right? Absolutely. Uh, the intention is to was to create this uh, for an NFT. Uh, there will also be a visual NFT, uh, slightly expanded on the same thing. Uh, on the same theme by myself and former Mondo 2000 art director Bart Nagel. So we'll be pulling out the Mondo 2000 name and uh, it was uh, performed by Mondo Vanilli uh, with the punk rock singer blog Dahlia and uh, Mondo Vanilli was sort of a subsidiary label of Mondo 2000 via which I uh, wrote and recorded songs with uh, somebody who calls himself Scrappy Duchamp. So, uh, yeah, both, both those things will be put out as NFTs, uh, hopefully pretty soon. I'm, I'm hoping within a couple of weeks. Fantastic. Fantastic. Looking forward to it, too. So how, um, how do you uh, look at uh, the legacy of Mondo 2000? Uh, what, uh, from 30 years ago, uh, looking at today you are happy to see that has happened uh, what you are surprised didn't happen and uh, what you're surprised that happened and you didn't expect okay well i mean we labeled ourselves a ribbon letter, letter bomb uh to the core address of consensus reality and the explosion of consensus reality has been far more unpleasant than I expected it to be. Um, you know, we were looking at it from uh, uh, a uh, left libertarian countercultural perspective that if we uh, exploded the mainline consensus at the time, as we were getting going on this with Mel Brighton and George H.W. Bush, uh, that uh, many gifts would uh, 
would come forth. And uh, what we've learned is that uh, many people are not prepared for the explosion of uh, consensus, uh, that it uh, leads to confusion, uh, that the idea that one should uh, destroy or ignore mainstream uh, media was uh, an exaggeration uh, that has not boded well for people who need to uh, hear something that is uh, at least uh, within a fingernail distance of facts uh, rather than whatever uh, made up stuff they're happy to uh, believe that they find in peculiar nooks and crannies of the internet. So um, there's that. I mean, our, our theme was that uh, every uh, man, woman, and, and other would uh, uh, become a uh, media broadcasting tower. Everyone would have their own, would have their own media or every group of people, every collectivity, every, uh, you know, uh, uh, creative uh, grouping would, would have access to uh, sending out their mediated creations to anybody else who happened to have access to the internet. And, and that's, that's happened and it's kind of fantastic in many ways. Um, so that, that has proven to be interesting. Um, we saw it as we were looking at a collaborative uh, a mechanism for collaboration. And uh, there was kind of a collaborationist ideology that was uh, sort of a, a, a soft core version of the uh, anarchist philosophy of mutual aid. And uh, in the view of the uh, early 90s, this didn't require a lot of politics. This was just going to emerge as uh, as a property of the new technology as everybody uh, was able to get online. So, uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's just turned out to be much more richly complex and, and weird <laughs> than even we thought. I mean, we thought we were weird. And, you know, I mean, we used to have a guy who used to write us letters called Xander Krasinski, who had the wildest, what we thought were the wildest conspiracy theories. Um, and we knew Xander, and we, we never knew, and still don't know, and I don't think he ever knew whether he really believes them or not. And as you know, the kind of uh, uh, schizoculture uh, level that he was operating at. But, you know, you look at something like Q, and, you know, they're out doing uh, Xander Krasinski, and, you know, that's millions of followers, you know, they're in Dallas waiting for the dead Kennedys to reemerge, the literal, the real, the real dead Kennedys, the uh, former presidents and so forth. So yeah, reality, you just got bent and warped in ways that were uh, less than pleasant, probably psychedelic. I'm Rushkoff, Doug Rushkoff talks about how uh, uh, the internet has sort of achieved a, a psychedelic effect, but uh, right now it's kind of a kind of a bad trip. Um, but uh, on the other hand, we are seeing um, um, uh, a, a somewhat surprising a new wave uh, for a potential more mainstream acceptance of psychedelics. Um, the legalization yeah. of marijuana was uh, the, the the first, but uh, yeah. uh, also stronger uh, substances are uh, potentially uh, being declassified uh, at the state level, if not at the federal level in the U.S. Uh, what do you attribute this uh, new wave to? It's it's amazing to me that in, in the uh, in the cultural social environment that we're in, in the, in the politically difficult and hostile environment, the psychedelics seem to just be sneaking right in through the front door. Uh, people have decided that it's not, that it has great therapeutic value and it's not really the problem that they once uh, thought it was. And I, I really don't know where to, where to place this thing because it's, I mean, it's happening in two ways. It's happening um, through the therapeutic community. Um, and it's also just happening in places like Oakland where they basically say, grow your own and 
you know, it, it's yours. They're, they're, they're literally uh, withdrawing police pressure from psychedelic drugs, you know, as long as they're not instituted in a real commercial way. And then you have the commercial organizations that are, you know, you're out on, on the stock market now. Uh, Peter Thiel, uh, no comment. Uh, and, you know, others, others like that, you know, are actually forming companies to uh, sell psychedelics. It's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, there's, there's the microdosing, which I think is great. I mean, I like all of it. There's an aspect in which I think of SOMA. Uh, I think of, you know, psychedelics and wild, strong doses were part of a counterculture that was very uh, anti-mainstream. And uh, as SOMA, it could be thought of as something that uh, sort of calms the masses and makes everything kind of uh, acceptable, uh, even when it's not. So there's always that, that danger, which... Uh, Actually, it's something that Timothy Leary warned about and Abby Hoffman warned about and a lot of counterculture people warned about. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's great. I think people need it. People need therapeutic help on a, a massive level. Uh, there's, there appears to be a lot of uh, psychological distress around. I, I, think, I, think, I, think it's a, I think that's also a product of, of virtualization. And and uh, uh, probably or possibly uh, these uh, threads are uh, connected and intertwined. Uh, the yeah. um, fragmenting of uh, reality uh, around us uh, can be attributed uh, to technological acceleration exceeding the limits of our of our adaptability and our ability to interpret. Uh, reality, uh, if we under we do not understand the uh, agents and the agency uh, that uh, technology is is expressing, uh, at the same time, um, psychedelics uh, put us in touch uh, with how wrong the assumption that reality has a fundamental baseline. Uh, that uh, we can rely on is uh, it, while uh, giving us uh, some uh, confidence in abandoning that assumption and, and, and knowing that our relationships, our love for each other uh, and the desire to, to, to build and create do not depend on those assumptions. So that could be one way that these uh, trends uh, uh, exist uh, together. Uh, another, I, I think that we're we're seeing what people think. Um, you know, we used to just sort of see people casually, and you know, maybe if we're hanging out in a bar or watching a ball game on TV or something, people would say something weird. But you could kind of you'd both smile at each other and you'd shrug it off. And now that is taken away, and we're just seeing precisely what people think. And you know. Uh, uh, Sartre said, uh, hell is other people, and now I say hell is other people's tweets. Uh, so we see what other people think, and, and we don't like each other. We don't like the way, you know, or we like the way some other people think, and we gather in these groups that uh, we, who, who are mutuals and, uh, and then become very upset. And I think that, I mean, do the right thing has become say the right thing. And mm -hmm. I think there's an insane level of anxiety attached to that. Uh, it, do, you, do you think that uh, uh, political cor correctness and, and uh, social justice expectations uh, have reached their maximum yet? Uh, if they have not, uh, to what degree uh, censorship and self-censorship uh, is going to be uh, affecting uh, daily lives of uh, people who don't accept or don't tolerate their own weirdness and the weirdness of others. I mean, my, my personal observation is that people in, in my area seem to be dialing it back a little bit. Uh, 
You know, uh, uh, you can be an asshole about being right, uh, which is something that a lot of people on the left don't understand, uh, but maybe are beginning some of them to understand. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the, the sort of waves of, uh, of uh, anarcho-Stalinism or, you know, I don't know how to phrase it, uh, the, the exclusionary, the persecutorial uh, energy, um, I, I think it's very related to, uh, to uh, virtualization. And, you mm-hmm. know, so probably it'll, it'll keep on. It'll keep on rolling on. That's anxiety about saying the right thing or representing the right thing. Uh, just seems to be an area of, uh, of real, real extreme anxiety. And I mean, it could be related to how people are actually living in the in the real world and the difficulties there. I mean, we we were we were forced virtualized by the pandemic, and uh, I mean, in, in a really extreme way that we haven't quite sorted out yet and we're sort of still still there uh to a great degree and there's there are more epidemics and problems around that we 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 have uh, uh for a long time assumed uh, almost as an axiom that uh, uh, our digital platforms are eliminating distances uh, and that uh, the global village uh, uh, is going to be uh, one well yeah. The distances were eliminated, but rather than a global village, it's kind of a, a, a global chaos uh, in which uh, uh, our breathing space uh, uh, is uh, necessary in order to keep uh, those we feel are incompatible with us at a distance. What we did, you know, well, Mc- McLuhan uh, wrote the Global Village and the counterculture and embraced that as a utopian notion, but McLuhan himself said that the global village was going to amplify conflicts in every possible way. <laughs> That's right. What, that. we, what, what, what we maybe didn't expect is that a similar phenomenon would uh, also uh, manifest itself uh, around time. I noticed um, how it is almost a standard disclaimer uh, on stand-up comedians' uh, specials as they start, uh, uh, you know, telling their jokes, I know in 10 years' time, this is going to be completely unacceptable. Ah. But I don't know what to do about it, right? Uh, right. We, we are starting to understand that our norms are evolving and that we have no ability of realizing uh, at whatever barbaric stage we are. Um, yeah. I have a few assumptions around those, right? Um uh, today, most of the people uh, are queasy or uh, completely against uh, uh, euthanasia, for example. And I expect mm. uh, in a given amount of time, let's say 10 years, but certainly 50, it is going to be the norm. And there will be many other ways. Uh, I, I expect that with uh, the uh, uh, increasing uh, environmental cost and explicit accounting for the impact of um, uh, uh, meat uh, eating meat, cultivated meat, not only is going to be uh, much cheaper, uh, like an order of magnitude cheaper, it is also going to be much richer as an option with uh, Michelin star uh, recipes uh, available from your uh, robot uh, uh, kitchen, uh, but it is also going to be the moral choice. Uh, a little bit like, uh, especially in the US, uh, n- today, uh, tobacco smoking is more persecuted than uh, uh, pot smoking. Uh, the uh, same uh, moral panic is going to aggregate around consumption of animal meat. So there will be very, very interesting uh, uh, evolutions of our moral positions. But even though I gave a couple of examples, most of them will be impossible to anticipate. And they will survive. There's always the the backlash. The backlash, even if it's a minority, will 
always be extreme. Uh, you see that in the case of uh, gender change and gender fluidity right right now. Right now. And the the uh, peculiarity of the hysteria against it and the anxiety uh, for it as well is very high. Uh, but yeah, we'll see backlashes against these uh, these shifts. Yeah, these things ebb and flow also. You are talking about uh, the uh, digital uh, plane uh, in um, critical tones uh, in the sense that they uh, the, the, the platforms uh, that uh, brought uh, virtual activities in the forefront and in the mainstream contributed to the fragmentation of our reality. And as a consequence, I'm curious, especially uh, about what you uh, think of uh, uh, the metaverse, both as we uh, uh, were talking about it, you know, 30 years ago, through the books of uh, uh, William Gibson or, or near Neil Stephenson, but also um, what a perversion of those concepts uh, someone like Facebook, now Meta, is trying to push down our thoughts. Uh, how do you feel about uh, uh, the, the current incarnation of the metaverse? Uh, do you expect it will be successful, it will fail, and it in, in both cases, what will be the reason for its success or its failure? Yeah, well, I mean, even back in the 90s, we were joking that uh, uh, we would be having the, the, the advertisements and the ownership mainlined into our, into our brains, right? I, I mean, that the far extensive uh, transhuman uh, human uh, singularitarian version of that would be to actually be downloaded onto the net, but to have our lives owned by a uh, company uh, that charges us rent or uh, feeds us constant uh, advertising feeds. Um, I mean, it's all kind of inevitable. It's all kind of uh, scary, and it's also kind of fun, right? I mean, getting virtual reality available, even if it's through Facebook, you know, there's going to be creative ops there. They're going to be people at play. You know, I, I talked at the beginning uh, in the reading from my book about man at play um, and, you know, our play being virtualized and less embodied has its downside and its risks and it's being owned to a great extent by corporations that has its risks. Now, it's interesting we talk about uh, uh, these large corporations uh, taking cyberspace and leading it into fragmentation, but in a way... Uh, they created mega stores that brought everybody into the same space. It, if, if it had remained independent with billions of websites, it might even be more fragmented now. Um, so I don't know. My life is life is peculiar and unpredictable. Um, I think the metaverse is is trippy and uh, multiplex, and uh, hopefully will not create some kind of a weird monoculture at the end of it, some kind of Borgian, uh, semi-Borgian kind of kind of thing. But I mean, it's all, it's all rather still up for grabs, even, even with the uh, imposition of capital and so forth. What, what made me uh, realize that uh, if not the current wave, uh, within three, four years, uh, we will have a new generation of interfaces that are going to start delivering on at least some of the promise of both uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, which I actually see as a spectrum uh, uh, of uh, continuity from one extreme to the other, not, uh, um, you know, alternatives uh, in, in, in black and white, is the statistic that came out recently that smartphone sales are declining worldwide for Samsung, wow. for Apple. The reason is simple. We all have one. And they are so damn good that uh, uh, as much as they want us, every year we are not going to spend another $1,000 or so for the next model. We will wait longer and longer. We will wait three, four years. I actually 
uh, am not ashamed to admit that I have an iPhone 10. You know, we are now an yeah. iPhone 13 and then soon 14. So I was I think, able... my, I think mine's a six, actually. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and Apple is expected next year to come out with uh, a, a very high priced $2,000 plus uh, visor, uh, initially mostly for developers, uh, that is going to pave the way for ever more performing and ever cheaper versions uh, once the applications and the user interfaces are there as well. So the fragmentation and the multiplication of ways of looking at the world is going to um, be supercharged uh, at that point. And uh, in, I don't know um, how uh, nation states and uh, the political system and the governance uh, that uh, runs cities, states, and nations is going to cope uh, with that kind of pressure. Uh, and whether uh, we should multiply our efforts uh, to prepare and to understand uh, what can we do when uh, the traditional tools are going to be so completely obsoleted by the new tools which uh, suck us into these disparate realities. Yeah, well, there seems to be an amplification of uh, nationalism actually in, in the midst of all these uh, changes and, and pressures. And, uh, and, you know, it could be that perhaps that that's a very uh, conscious effort to maintain the old guard. Although, I mean, the... the main establishment, the sort of neoliberal establishment is very much against the uh, the, the, the nationalist push. Um, so again, there's a peculiar tug of war going on going on there. but um, yeah, the, the uh, control by nation states, I mean we, we thought it would be out of control by now and nation states really uh, uh, they're pretty strong. they keep on uh, revenating and, and returning and uh, creating you know having having power maybe not maybe not uh, precisely the same power that they had before to uh, organize society but uh, certainly the power to uh, uh, criminalize those which they uh, want to criminalize and try to maintain some, form of authority and order and uh, in many cases uh, the, the level of uh, dysfunction created by the distortion of, uh, of uh, consensus reality justifies the uh, intrusion of the state into uh, so many situations. For example, the the internet. I mean, there are very few people who think that uh, the internet should just run wild and free and completely uh, uncensored. Now, uh, many of the same people who were uh, uh, the most adamant about letting uh, anything go, everything goes on the internet, are now most adamant about uh, shutting down uh, particularly ugly vectors of the internet. From a coming from a particular place, actually, but uh, yes. Uh, so, 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 uh, with, with, with your with your anarchist roots, uh, you uh, uh, are now in a point where you are finding a new balance uh, between um, a free for all and the necessity of. Uh, at the, of, of a certain degree of, of control. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would guess so. I mean, I, I, I always uh, dial back to the position that I don't take a position uh, as, as, as an absurdist, you know, as a churchster doing a uh, NFT against NFTs or, an NF, or a uh, pro-NFT against NFTs thing. 
Um, I always prefer to be in the uh, Warholian position of just uh, letting myself be a blank slate uh, upon which people can uh, project whatever they they wish. But I do accept being interviews, and then I start giving opinions, and then I end up in trouble. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, um, in in that sense, uh, to be able to interpret the zeitgeist uh, really means um, yeah. being as devoid of preconceptions as possible, yeah. uh, and then. Uh, absorbing, collecting, and then reflecting uh, both uh, in terms of uh, giving back, but also in terms of, of having analyzed and having re-elaborated uh, what uh, uh, the, the world is uh, messaging to you. Um, yeah. and, and that is a very precious and unique position. Yeah, I also want to add that... Uh, I mean, we utopians of the 1980s and 1990s, uh, most of them, most of us, the majority of us were North Americans, we were Caucasians, and we were men. Um, and the utopian we hoped for hasn't come true, but the world has come in. And uh, it's a great uh, uh, opportunity and movement of uh, communication uh, by and throughout the rest of the world that was excluded from the early days of the internet. So that's one of the great things about the current situation. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the black Twitter, uh, what what's called black Twitter is one of the cleverest and, and most amusing and most artistic areas uh, on the internet now. Um, so these things have, have changed. So uh, us old fogies can kind of look and go, uh, Geez, it didn't turn out the way we uh, wanted it to. But there's 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 this other incursion that's also positive going on. Um, so, in order to check out uh, uh, the Mondo uh, 2000 History Project, uh, people can go on the web on mondo2000.com, and uh, they can also follow uh, 2000 underscore Mondo on Twitter. Uh, and um, I am sure that they will uh, enjoy that uh, greatly. Um, and uh, rather than um, showing here the somewhat longish URL of the uh, song uh, homepage where it can be uh, both, I, I uh, invite our viewers to go there from Twitter because it is linked on Twitter and uh, they will find it easily. Um, so any any parting words uh, to our viewers uh, are you? Uh, what would you like them to do uh, as they listen to your uh, Dadaistic absurdist uh, uh, memories, uh, but also discover the gems of uh, wisdom in them? Well, I mean, I, I do hope people go to my uh, band camp, look up Are You Serious band camp, and there's lots of uh, weird stuff on there and uh, brilliant music. I, I have to credit the musicians. You know, they're, they're not fooling around. They're not, they're not just uh, amateurs. They're actually, it's real music going on there. Um, so, yeah, come to Mondo2000.com um, and... Uh, yeah, just uh, and, and keep an eye out for uh, Freaks in the Machine. Freaks and the Machine. We will uh, certainly uh, going to be um, reading it either eagerly as soon as it is out. And in the meantime, I thank you for uh, the uh, snippet that you read us. I'm going to say goodbye to our viewers now, but please stay on so that uh, I can say goodbye to you personally as well. Thank you very much for uh, watching uh, this episode of uh, Searching for the Question uh, with Are You Serious founder and editor of Mondo 2000, uh, lyricist and writer. Uh, and uh, I was uh, really excited to have him on the show. I hope uh, you liked it as well. And I'm looking forward to uh, welcome you at the next episode of Searching for the Question. Goodbye.